Good morning. My name is Eric Wise. I'm the program coordinator for the lectures and seminars at the Heritage Foundation. It's my privilege to welcome our guests to the Douglas and Sarah Allison Auditorium, as well as those joining us via the heritage.org website and C-SPAN Live. A notice to viewers, questions can be submitted via email to speaker at heritage.org, speaker at heritage.org. If you would, please uh, turn off all your cell phones and other electronic devices as they'll interfere with recording. For further reference, this program will be posted within 24 hours on the heritage.org website. Hosting our program today is Edwin Meese. Mr. Meese currently serves as the Ronald Reagan Distinguished Fellow in Public Policy and Chairman of the Center for Legal and Judicial Studies for the Heritage Foundation. Mr. Meese was also the 75th Attorney General of the United States and among President Ronald Reagan's most trusted advisors. Mr. Meese. Thank you. I join in uh, welcoming you on behalf of the Heritage Foundation and uh, the Center for Legal and Judicial Studies, which is uh, an important part of this organization. We have a program on crime control and public safety, which deals with the kinds of issues such as we're discussing this morning. Today's topic is very timely. This October term, which uh, will begin in just a, a few months now, the United States Supreme Court will hear two cases from Florida that are brought by convicts serving life terms without parole for crimes that they committed as juveniles. The law, of course, defines juveniles as those persons uh, to be below the age of 18. Uh, the coalition that persuaded some years ago the court to discover a new limitation on capital punishment, which took place in 2005 in the case of Roper against Simmons, is now seeking to achieve a constitutional end run around 43 state legislatures, the District of Columbia, and the federal government, each of whom has authorized the sentence of life without parole for the worst juvenile offenders. As we all know, and as the Supreme Court has stated repeatedly, a death is different. Uh, and that's why uh, the, that coalition was able to prevail on changing what had been the historic uh, two centuries of law on uh, relating to capital punishment for juveniles. Yet if this coalition succeeds in a non-death penalty line of cases, it would be a major step towards subjecting all criminal sentences at the federal and state level to the kind of Eighth Amendment jurisprudence and scrutiny that the court has previously applied in capital cases, where, uh, as former Justice uh, Sandra Day O'Connor uh, has observed, uh, the court has frequently usurped the legislative function. To date, uh, this important public policy debate has been shaped by a carefully crafted campaign of misinformation. Legislatures, courts, the public, and the media have all been misled on crucial points uh, concerning this particular subject. Until now, that is. And so today we are delighted to present the result of a study that has taken place over a year and a half in which the uh, in which uh, the results of that work has been brought together in a, the form of a book that is entitled Adult Time for Adult Crime. The book, which has been spearheaded by the Heritage Foundation and particularly our senior fellow, Cully Stimson, who is a member of our panel today, was a collaborative effort involving prosecutors, defense attorneys, human rights advocates, victims' rights advocates, uh, law enforcement officials, international law scholars, and many others. The book aims to set straight the record on this subject and to educate the public, legislators, courts, and others about the facts of the crimes, the sentences, and the law that relates to this topic. The conclusions are simple. First, juvenile life without possibility of parole is reasonable, constitutional, and appropriately rare. Secondly, Contrary to what uh, many have contended, the United States has no international obligation to ban the life without parole sentence for serious juvenile criminals. Joining us today to discuss this issue are three distinguished attorneys. Each believes that the juvenile justice system in our country should handle the vast majority of crimes committed by juveniles. But each believes also in the rehabilitative potential for most juvenile criminals but each also believes that life without parole for some small percentage 
of juvenile killers and violent teens is appropriate. Our speakers include Paul Wallace, who is the Chief of Appeals in the Criminal Division for the Delaware Department of Justice. He's argued a number of cases, including the Tories case about a 14-year-old murderer before the Delaware Supreme Court and won the case. It hi it's highlighted on page 46 of this new book. For the last 20 years, he's been a frontline prosecutor and has had numerous leader posi leadership positions in the Delaware Attorney General's office. He's been the chief prosecutor for Newcastle County. He's been head of the felony trial, sex crimes, white collar crimes, career criminal, and misdemeanor units within that office. He's acted as the legislative counsel for the Delaware Attorney General and has authored numerous state criminal laws. He has argued numerous cases before the state Supreme Court and in federal trial and appellate courts on behalf of the state of Delaware. Another one of our panelists is Daniel Horowitz. He's been a renowned California defense, criminal defense attorney uh, for the last 29 years. He appears often as a legal commentator on CNN's Nancy Grace show uh, on uh, M M MSNBC and Fox News and on other television programs. He's tried over 200 cases and jury trials as a defense attorney. He's been a member of and a lecturer for the two main California defense attorney organizations in that state. He's taught at the California Death Penalty College for defense attorneys, and he's handled 27 death penalty cases, eight of which went to trial and two were dismissed. Only one client out of 27 received the death penalty. Unfortunately, on the 15th of October in the year 2005, his beautiful wife Pamela was murdered by a 17-year-old juvenile. The juvenile was convicted and was sentenced to life without parole. Our final speaker is Cully Stimson. He's the senior legal fellow here at the Heritage Foundation. Prior to joining Heritage, he was a Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense under the presidency of George W. Bush. He has been a local, state, and federal military prosecutor and has also been a defense attorney. He's a former instructor at the Naval Justice School, an adjunct professor of law at the George Mason University School of Law. He's tried over 100 jury trials as both a prosecutor and a defense attorney. And he is a co-author of the book, Adult Time for Adult Crimes. As you can see, we have an expert panel to deal with this subject and so we will present our first speaker, uh, who is uh, Paul, uh, is it Paul? Uh, Paul Wallace will be our first speaker this morning and present uh, the initial topic to you. Paul? General Meese, I think I would uh, like to just uh, welcome everybody here. Uh, thank you for your very kind uh, framing of the issue uh, and the introductions. And I thought it would uh, be helpful instead of me jumping in and talking about uh, the large report or small book, uh, first, it would be better to have a historical perspective of Eighth Amendment jurisprudence in non-lawyerly terms uh, from Paul Wallace, who's tried these cases, argued these cases before the Delaware Supreme Court, and then we'll move to uh, the findings we've had in the book, and then turn uh, finally to Dan Horowitz, uh, understanding that we want to leave time for your questions, and that's why we have our trusty timekeeper and assistant here who will be sh flashing some cards to tell us when to be quiet. So, Paul? Uh, thank you, Colin. There's no statement in any public policy discussion that can chill that discussion more quickly than when someone, especially a lawyer, says it's unconstitutional to do whatever, fill in the blank. I saw it both as a trial attorney and as, a, as an appellate attorney, but also as a legislative attorney um, for 15 years in Delaware. In the current discussion about life without parole for juvenile offenders, violent juvenile offenders, basically that comes down to two claims. One, the juvenile can never constitutionally be given life without parole, or two, that in fact the Constitution requires that a court take into consideration youth before it can be constitutionally imposed. It's just not true. The law does not say that. It has never said it in the history of, Del of the United States Constitution or in any state. 
here's why. You have to first go back to what the beginning of the Eighth Amendment jurisprudence is, and that's common law. At common law, basically what occurred is that anyone who had the mental ability to be criminally responsible was considered an adult and could be punished as an adult. That grew into basically the rule of infancy in English law and then imported into the United States that someone who was under seven is deemed to be not competent. They cannot be treated as an adult. They can't be held criminally responsible. And that there was what's called a rebuttable presumption. That when one was between seven and 14 years old, that in fact they may be. It was, they were deemed not to be, but they may be depending on the individual characteristics of the person and what the court finds. And then for those who were 14 and over, there was the rebuttable presumption that, in fact, they were criminally responsible. And in those circumstances, could be treated as adults and receive adult punishment. As we move to the history of the United States and crime and punishment, particularly in the Eighth Amendment, because it's always framed that this is a cruel and unusual punishment, and in fact, as those words have always been defined by the United States Supreme Court and by the vast majority of courts uh, in the United States, it's neither. The Cruel and Unusual Punishment Clause started to basically ensure that there wasn't torture. It meant to talk about the method of punishment. It ensured the United States did not import into our jurisprudence things like pillorying, drawing and quartering, those types of things. And for a century and a half, until the early 1900s, that particular amendment was never looked at to discuss incarceration. It was never looked at to determine the length of a sentence. And then in 1910, in a case called Weems versus the United States, the Supreme Court first looked at it, first looked at the length of a sentence. But what was very important and it was explained about 50 years later by the United States Supreme Court, was not the length of the sentence so much, but the fact that it was disproportionate to the crime that was committed. It was a falsification of public records, basically what we would call nowadays white-collar crime. And for it, the defendant received 12 years at hard and painful labor, labor in irons. You can see a bit of the torture aspect of such a sentence and why the Supreme Court would be concerned. But the Supreme Court made a pretty broad pronouncement in saying that it would look at excessive sentences or disproportionate sentences. And then for the next 50 years did not find any sentence to be that. And in fact, outside the death penalty context has never found a sentence of incarceration to be disproportionate, no matter what. It's found other types of punishments. In the 1960s, it had looked at a case where someone was uh, made an expatriate. In other words, they were stripped of their citizenship and left as a person without, it was an American-born person, left without a country. So that is unusual. In fact, other countries did not do that. In fact, the United States had never done that. And so it had determined that when looking at a sentence, it should look at what it said are the standards of decency. But those standards of decency, it has always said, are applicable, and as since always said, are applicable in the death penalty context. It moves us to the 60s and where we are uh, coming into what was one of the biggest uh, crime waves, unfortunately, in the United States history, and one which many states, and Cully will talk about the trends in legislation, but where states had decided, in fact, that they were going to get tougher on crime in certain ways. And one of the ways was ensuring that adult sentences may be applicable to juvenile offenders, particularly violent juvenile offenders, and overwhelmingly made those sentences available. At the same time, we had the death penalty being reinstituted in the United States. There were a period in the mid-70s 
by the early 80s, many states had the death penalty back again as a possible punishment. When it did so, there began to be questions as to how the death penalty would be applied. And what came out of the United States Supreme Court's jurisprudence was basically the sense that the death penalty has to be individualized. It has to be proportionate to the crime, murder, and that any court, any law, has to allow individual factors to play a part in whether or not someone should receive that ultimate penalty. What happened then is there was a turn from that individualized capital sentencing idea to determine whether or not it should be applied to these new sentences. For instance, three strikes, you're outlaw. Something that may put someone in jail for the rest of their life for a crime that they normally would not be based on their criminal past. And there the Supreme Court kept the line and has kept the line between death penalty cases and incarceration, even life without parole incarceration. The disturbing part in the current discussion is this, that certain people want to blur that line. They want to take down that wall between those sentences. The importance of that wall is this. The United States Supreme Court has always said that you don't even look at the Eighth Amendment unless, in fact, it is the sentence is grossly disproportionate and grossly disproportionate to the crime. That's the importance in the discussion that we have today because the crimes we are speaking of overwhelmingly in the juvenile context are murder, but are also other crimes for which someone may get life imprisonment, rape, kidnapping, those few crimes where life is an option. And that's what this is about. Whether or not life without parole can remain an option. In the constitutional context, the United States Supreme Court has always said that for those crimes, for those specific offenses, it is an option both for adults and for juveniles. And that's why, overall, legislators have endorsed the use of that sentence, at least as a possibility. As I was introduced, I've been a prosecutor for 20 years. I fully believe in the juvenile justice system. I fully believe that you have to have a spectrum of treatment for juvenile offenders, those who are less, who don't, Uh, deserve that type of punishment because of their crime, they should be in the juvenile system. But unfortunately, I've also seen what can happen with certain youthful murderers. Their crimes are no different than adults. There is no gross disproportionality in the crime that they commit and the sentence that they receive. And therefore, just as the Constitution says, We need look no further, at least in the constitutional argument, as to whether or not the Eighth Amendment permits these types of sentences. It's also important to note that although every right-thinking prosecutor, I think every right-thinking criminal lawyer, believes that there's a place for the juvenile system, even courts have said there is no constitutional right to even be treated as a juvenile in any circumstance, no matter what. So we're not even close to the line that any court would be concerned about. The blurring of that line has real implications. If we do not say that we keep the test that we have now, that it has to be some great disproportion between the crime committed and the sentence received, then what we do is we basically open the door to second-guessing every type of sentencing, every type of legislative act, because in the constitutional sense, merely relieving life without parole won't make sense to what those folks who might believe this change uh, make sense. What would have to happen would be that 
federal courts, state courts, would have to start to set some arbitrary rules as to when, in fact, a juvenile who has killed has to get a parole hearing. It would have to make it as of right. The Eighth Amendment simply does not require that. All it requires are proportionate sentences. The use of the death penalty, um, and specifically some of the findings in Roper, makes it quite difficult. It actually makes it difficult for the other side. Because in that very case, the United States Supreme Court said one of the reasons it was striking the death penalty for juveniles was because life without parole was there and that that was an appropriate sentence, a proportionate sentence to what they had done. It would make absolutely no sense for the United States Supreme Court to say we are striking the death penalty because we have this option. That option must be there. It's used rarely. It is used in the most serious of cases, but there is nothing constitutionally that prohibits it from being there. As um, General Meese had introduced me earlier and, and, and Cully, I've actually prosecuted these cases. I prosecuted them as a trial lawyer. I've uh, defended them, uh, the sentences on appeal, and had two within the last year. Um, there are some disturbing aspects to how they're litigated. One, the application or the that I've already talked about, the application of death penalty law to non-death cases. These are not death sentences. In fact, as uh, other courts have found, in addition to the United States Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court, when it struck the death penalty, said that it was concerned that the offenders have an opportunity to learn about the crime that they committed, that they wanted them to mature and under have a mature understanding of the damage that they had done, and did not believe that they could do that if put to death. A life without parole sentence does precisely that. It does give them that opportunity. It also gives the opportunity for victims to have a peace of mind that this person is made to pay for the crime that they committed and is safely away from others in society. One of the cases that um, I tried, or I did not try, but I have heard on appeal and I litigated on appeal was Torres versus State, which is in the study. In that case, a 14-year-old was uh, became friends with a family. They became, became friends with the family because what happened was he threw a rock through the windshield of the father's car. The father actually wouldn't report it to the police and said, I don't want to report it to the police. I had a rough childhood myself. Let me make him work to pay back. He actually took him fishing over the next month or so and made friends with him. When the young man tried to teach his three and a half year old son how to light matches, he scolded him for it. A few days later, what Donald Torres did was broke into that house. He spread kerosene all over the bottom floor, including at the stairwell. He later said he knew what he was doing. He knew the family was there, and then he lit it on fire. He watched as the father came out and then watched, go, watched him go back in screaming for his children and his wife. They were the Gott family in Delaware. Mr. Gott was found trying to shield his wife from the flames. He died. His wife died also, and their three-and-a-half-year-old and, and one-year-old died in that fire. Now apply, if you try to apply, what is asked for by the other side in this discussion. It would say that no matter what, at some point, we have to say that Donald Torres gets a parole hearing. The problem is it would turn our sentencing scheme upside down. Because in Delaware, we have consecutive sentences. And not only do we have consecutive sentences, but you can, your parole eligibility is also consecutive. So what it would say is instead of waiting the 60 years that he has to wait for parole, in order for them to get what they wish on the other side of this litigation in this case, the court would have to set some arbitrary number. Three of those killings are free, basically. You get some volume discount for violence. That doesn't make sense. And it's certainly not, not constitutionally required. 
Donald Torres' case is some of the other cases or how I came to be part of this discussion today. Um, I certainly am willing and able to answer any questions that you have uh, when it is time to do this, when it is time to answer those questions. But what I'd suggest is this. The United States Supreme Court has had a very hands-off approach on cases other than death penalty cases, and for good reason. It wants to allow the several states to decide what is best for them. In Delaware, for instance, we've decided that consecutive sentences and life without parole for murder in the first degree is appropriate, even for someone who is 14, if they have made that decision. And by the way, in Torres, he did go through amenability hearings in the juvenile system. And the Superior Court, a judge looking at the facts of that case, looking at him, decided you will stay in adult court. Individual states need to have that ability. And the United States Supreme Court has never said constitutionally that's prohibited. In fact, it said exactly the opposite. States should be able to make those types of decisions for themselves. That there is absolutely no constitutional, in the, under the Eighth Amendment, Amendment, there is no constitutional requirement that everybody be the same that everybody have a certain parole eligibility, that everybody even treat each crime exactly the same as far as sentencing. Thank you, Paul. <clears throat> the issue of how a civilized and just society treats a criminal defendants is really a bellwether uh, to other countries of how just that society is. And it's an important topic. Uh, it's especially important in the context of how we as a society treat juveniles who make bad decisions, uh, like adult criminals. Uh, and in the issue of juveniles who murder and rape, how we deal with them is important. <coughs> to date, this debate has been driven by a misleading lobbying campaign before self, in the form of self-published uh, studies, which I'll go into, uh, disingenuous lobbying campaigns before state legislatures, aggressive uh, litigation before the courts, which is appropriate. But what's inappropriate is the misleading statistics and the false reading of Supreme Court precedent and the scurrilous accusation that this country is in violation of international law uh, by having life without parole sentences for juvenile killers and violent teens in the first place. We're not. That's why we're exceptionally pleased today to begin a new debate, a debate that is framed by a forthright, honest, and direct discussion of the actual facts. And the facts are these. Most juveniles deserve to be treated in the juvenile justice system. Everyone up here agrees with that. A very few percentage of juveniles need to be treated within the adult courts if the state so recognizes the ability of juveniles to be waived up to adult court. And a very, very small percentage of the worst juvenile offenders, the ones that we highlight in this book in our 16 case digests, deserved a fair trial, got a fair trial, and were justly sentenced to the constitutional sentence of life without parole. To date, we haven't had this type of debate. We haven't had the ability uh, to take a holistic view of what's happening in the country. And that's why I launched this study about a year and a half ago after attending a symposium in Monterey, California, where I learned that California was attempting through some state legislatures to abolish the sentence of life without parole for juvenile killers. Abolish it. Now, understand this, and these are the facts. 43 states, through their elected representatives, the voice of the people, have authorized life without the possibility of parole for juvenile killers and violent teens. That's well over 90% of the population of this country. The District of Columbia, where we are today, has authorized life without parole 
for juvenile killers. And the federal government indeed has a law in the books that authorizes life without parole for juvenile killers. So our federal government, 43 states and arguably one of the most liberal districts in the country here at DC has authorized that sentence. Those are facts. Yet when you listen to anti-incarceration activists, you would think that the society is really not there and that's uh, not where this country is. They're wrong. Furthermore, every state Supreme Court who has looked at life without the possibility of parole for juvenile killers and violent teens has found it to be constitutional. Every federal court who has looked at this broad question of whether life without the possibility of parole for juvenile killers and violent teens is constitutional has found that it's constitutional, that it's not grossly disproportionate to the crime. And notice when Paul was talking, he wasn't talking about grossly disproportionate to this particular criminal. That's what you do in death penalty cases. He's talking about what the courts talk about is whether or not this punishment <laughs> is grossly disproportionate to the crime committed by this person as authorized by state law. Now, you wouldn't know this if you'd been paying attention to or following the anti-incarceration activist reports over the last 10 years. You wouldn't know this if you read their briefs uh, before state Supreme Courts, like in the Torres case, or even before the U.S. Supreme Court in the petition for certiorari, which was granted this spring in the Graham and Sullivan cases, which are coming out of Florida. The question before the court in those cases, and they picked their cases wisely, they picked two people who did not commit murder but committed horrible crimes before they were 18, is whether the sentence which they justly received after a fair trial, life without the possibility of parole, is constitutional. They have failed to convince state legislatures to abolish these sentences. They have failed to convince state Supreme Courts to find these sentences unconstitutional. They have failed to get federal judges around the country to find these sentences unconstitutional. And so they're trying to make a constitutional end run around the representatives of the people and all the other judges and justices who have looked at this to discover a new right. A right which, and I use quotations, a right which will jeopardize all non-capital sentences potentially. It will essentially allow judges taken to its logical extreme to engage in a jump ball on every sentencing of every individual before them. The court has never allowed that and the court shouldn't allow that and I predict they won't allow that in this case. One of the I did not believe my friend uh, in California when she told me that the anti-incarceration activists had published reports uh, depicting pictures of eight and nine-year-olds uh, on the front covers of their reports uh, because I knew as a, a criminal defense attorney and a prosecutor and now a sitting judge in the military uh, that nobody no state sentences eight or nine year olds, uh, tiger scouts essentially, weeblos, uh, to life without parole for any crime they commit. They go in the juvenile justice system. Uh, and even if they, for one reason or another, would go uh, to an adult court if they were 10 or so, they're not going to get life without parole. And so, much to my surprise, uh, I looked at a few of the reports she was talking about. And this is what spurred me to conduct a comprehensive uh, research project. Here is a picture, clearly of a little boy. If I took a poll of this room, you would all say he's probably six, seven, eight years old. He's an actor, he's not a defendant. Uh, yet, uh, just on the front cover of one of the lead reports that the anti-incarceration activists have out there, uh, suggesting to legislators and judges, et cetera, that uh, this poor little fella, uh, this child, 
uh, committed a crime and is serving life without parole. He's not. Um, and look at all the other reports out there. This is one by the Equal Justice Initiative, uh, which is down in, I think it's Alabama. Uh, here's a picture of an actor, a boy, who probably you know plays in his little league baseball uh, squad and probably just ended up playing marbles a few weeks before. Uh, but there are numerous pictures throughout these reports of child actors um, which are there to pull at your heartstrings. They're in these reports to lead people who aren't going to think about it, like some people who have a busy calendar, a busy schedule, a busy legislative agenda, that this is typically the t type of kid who's, who's who's uh, sentenced to life without parole. Well, it gets better. Um, the Roper decision um, is a death penalty decision. And Roper himself uh, thought about his crime before he committed it, deliberated before he committed it, and he committed it. And the Supreme Court found that his death sentence was unconstitutional, fine but what the anti-incarceration activists now have attempted to do is to take the language and logic of Roper and import it out of the death penalty specific arena and into the uh, non-death penalty arena of life without parole. And they use almost laughable language like sentencing our children to die in prison. It's not a death penalty case, it's a life without parole case. And if you look, there's a very unsubtle uh, coordination between this small yet well-funded uh, movement uh, suggesting that they never use the word juvenile, which all of us use in our practices. All the judges use it. All the criminal defense attorneys use it. They use child because they want you to think that these are children. They're not. They're juveniles. They're teenagers. The United States has the worst crime problem in the Western world. We do. If you look at my report, I look at the UN statistics and the World Health Organization statistics to show that we lead the Western world in juvenile crime and have done so for decades. Juveniles commit murder, rape, robbery, aggravated assault, and other serious crimes in numbers that dwarf those of America's international peers. You see, the campaign so far is essentially wrapped in these principles. All the countries are the same around the world. The U.S. has life without parole. Uh, other countries don't. We're in violation of international norms. All countries are essentially the same. These are children. We're mean. And by the way, we're in violation of international treaties. All of which is demonstrably false. And we go through it page by page, chapter by chapter, in this report, in a highly footnoted report. And unlike the reports of the other side, we trace back to original sources and tell you everything we consulted in every single footnote in our report. Between 1980 and 2005, 43,621 juveniles were arrested for murder in the United States. And the picture is just as bleak with respect to rape 109,563, robbery, 818,278, and aggravated assault, 1,240,199. That is uncontroverted. Yet when you compare the statistics with us against the rest of the world, you see that we dwarf Western Europe and the rest of the world in terms of our crime statistics. We have a big problem. And we could debate and discuss what those problems are and what the roots of it are and how we should address those. And I think that that is an ongoing worthy debate. But the facts are the facts. Let me give you an example. This is in chapter three of the paper.
1998 alone, 24,537,600 recorded crimes were committed in the United States. That means of the 72 countries that reported their statistics to the UN that year, and this year, that year is no different than the other years, we rank first in recorded crimes. In fact, the United States reported more crimes than the next six countries, Germany, England and Wales, France, South Africa, Russia, and Canada combined. And the picture is just as bleak with respect to juvenile crime. And so it should come as no surprise uh, to any of us in this room, I hope, that states over the years have responded to this explosion in juvenile crime by making some laws applicable to juveniles and over the years uh, making it possible for the government in the states to waive or push juveniles from <coughs> juvenile court to adult court for certain specific heinous crimes like murder, rape, uh, aggravated robbery, aggravated assault, uh, kidnapping, extortion, bomb making, terrorist threats, and those types of things. And for a very small percentage of those, uh, you have the possibility of life without parole uh, for juvenile killers. Um, <coughs> the other thing that you see, uh, have seen to date, is this notion uh, put out by the Amnesty International Human Rights Watch report, which is the lead report in this uh, area, that there are 2,225 juveniles in the United States uh, serving life without parole. Folks, that number is a fallacy. It's a manufactured statistic. We go through their very own reports, including their footnotes, and show the methodological flaws uh, in their uh, report. First off, it is true, as they note, that there is no one repository within the Department of Justice or in each of the 50 states or the District of Columbia that keeps the statistics of how many juveniles are serving life without the possibility of parole. Now there is a division of the Department of Justice that keeps that for 23 states, but not all states. And so instead of accepting those statistics, which is a little over 1,100 uh, or so um, juveniles serving life without the possibility of parole in those 43 states, uh, they manufacture assumptions. They assume, for instance, that it takes uh, around two years between the time of arrest to the time somebody gets sent to jail when we know from our analysis that uh, oftentimes it takes much less time, in fact months or weeks. Uh, many of the juveniles uh, who commit these crimes get caught quickly and take a sentence uh, or a trial quickly and they're uh, <coughs> sent to jail. Yet what you see is this number picked up by the liberal media pushed before state legislatures when they're trying to abolish this sentence before state legislatures, and put in court documents. In fact, in the brief before the Supreme Court right now, they boldly assert, like they did in the Torres case before the Delaware Supreme Court, that there's 2,225 juveniles uh, serving life without the possibility of parole. It is a manufactured statistic. And let me turn finally to this uh, suggestion that we're in violation of international law. Uh, and that can be found on page 41 of the report. Many of the opponents of life without the possibility of parole for, for juvenile killers and violent teens suggest that uh, because there's this convention out there called the Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, that that's it. There's a convention out there, it bans life without the possibility of parole for juvenile killers and violent teens, and therefore, uh, uh, since we have it, we're in violation of the treaty. Well, there's a, a slight problem with that. Uh, we haven't ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child. <coughs> that would seem to end the discussion, but they don't end their assertions there. They assert that, well, even though we haven't ratified it, um, it's customary international law, sort of the last bastion of a, of a desperate uh, advocate. Uh, and we explain why not only is it not customary international law, but why we have no obligation whatsoever uh, uh, to uh, over, to, 
to um, violate the will of the people as expressed to their state representatives and state laws. They also claim that we're in violation of the ICCPR, which is another civil rights treaty, and the Convention Against Torture. Uh, yet they fail to mention that we've taken exceptions, they're called reservations in international law, uh, to the provisions there that would hint at uh, long sentences for juveniles. And by the way, neither of those treaties uh, by, uh, bans life without parole for juveniles at all. Uh, I know a little bit about uh, the Convention Against Torture because I was the lead DOD delegate to Geneva when we submitted our last periodic report in 2006. So I'm intimately familiar uh, with the convention that they say we're in violation of, which we're not. And finally, I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with this. Um, as you can see in the book, we uh, wrote 243 different DA offices around the country. We asked for case digests. Um, uh, from those DA offices around the country uh, where the person got life without the possibility of parole as a sentence. We asked for original court documents, court findings, judges' findings, police reports, um, uh, to get an accurate picture of the real crimes and the real facts that these juveniles uh, did. Um, and what we found was vastly different than the glossed over uh, non-culpable language that they include in their reports. And I'll leave you uh, with one small snippet of one of the 16 case studies, uh, which is found uh, prominently in some of the activists' case reports. And that is the case of Ashley Jones. And Ashley Jones is a 14-year-old uh, juvenile when she committed her crime. She's the cause celeb of uh, many on the left. Uh, and yet, uh, if you read their description of what she did, you're left sort of scratching your head, well, gosh, why did Ashley get life without the possibility of parole? Uh, well, then you can make up your mind, and this is just one of many of the case spins that they uh, have put out there. Um, this is the entirety of the quote-unquote facts that the anti-incarceration activists have put out there regarding Ashley Jones. And then I'll read you the facts as found by the judge. Quote, at 14, Ashley tried to escape the violence and abuse by running away with an older boyfriend who shot and killed her grandfather and aunt. Her grandmother and sister who were injured during the offense want Ashley to come home. That's what Ashley did according to the other side. When you read the judge's findings, which can be found on page 26, and I won't read the whole thing because I'm running out of time, you find out quite a different story. <clears throat> Ashley Jones stabbed her father and pregnant mother in 1998, uh, killing neither, uh, and so she and her younger sister were sent to live with her grandparents and maternal aunt. This is before the event where she got life without parole. In late August of that year, her grandparents were getting tired of her bad behavior and grounded her for staying out all night at a party. They did not approve of her boyfriend, Jer Jeremy Hart, and told, her, uh, told him not to visit their house, and this made uh, Ashley Jones angry. So Ashley Jones and Hart decided to kill everyone in the house, set it on fire, and take their money. To prepare, Ashley Jones stole two of her grandfather's guns and smuggled them out of the house to Hart. She mixed together rubbing alcohol, nail polish remover, and charcoal fire starter in anticipation of setting the house ablaze. This is from the judge's findings. It took the young couple two days to put their plan into action, and on the evening of August 30, 1999, she kept an eye on her relatives until they had settled in for the evening when she called her boyfriend, who arrived around 11.15 that night and she led him into the house. He was carrying the 38 revolver taken from her grandfather. They then snuck into the den where her grandfather was watching TV. Hart shot him twice in the face. Still alive, DeRoy Knowles is his name, stumbled toward the kitchen. Next, they visited the bedroom of Millie Knowles, her 30-year-old aunt, and shot her three times. Seeing that her aunt was still breathing, Ashley Jones hit her in the head with a portable heater stabbed her in the chest and attempted to set the room on fire. 
The gunshots awakened Jones's grandmother and she got out of bed. That was when Jones and Hart entered her bedroom and shot her once in the shoulder. It was their last bullet. Jones and Hart then returned to the den to discover that their grandfather was still alive. With knives from the kitchen, they stabbed him over and over again and left one knife embedded in his back. These are the judge's findings. Ashley Jones poured charcoal lighter fluid on her grandfather, set him ablaze, and listened to him groan as he burned alive. The noise attracted Jones's 10-year-old sister, Mary, uh, to the kitchen. From there, she could see that her grandfather uh, was burning. Soon after, the wounded Mary Knowles entered the kitchen and called out to her dying husband, and Ashley Jones stabbed her grandmother in the face with an ice pick, poured lighter fluid on her, set her on fire, and watched her burn. She ended up stabbing her 10-year-old sister uh, numerous times and left uh, the re everyone to die. Uh, she then took $300 from her grandparents' mattress and took the keys to their Cadillac, Cadillac and the boyfriend and girlfriend drove off for a fun night of partying. Um, and when the news reports the next morning that in fact Joan's sister had survived, Ashley said, quote, I thought I killed that bitch. She was sentenced uh, to life without the possibility of parole. And the judge, when she sentenced to Ashley, uh, said, quote, she did not express genuine remorse for her actions. Although she apologized at the prompting of the court, her words were hollow and insincere. Furthermore, it was brought to the attention of the court that while awaiting her sentencing, the defendant had threatened other female inmates in the Jefferson County Jail by telling them she would do the same thing to them that she had done to her family. These are the facts. They're not pretty, but we need to have now an open, honest, and forthright discussion uh, going forward. I'm sorry, Dan. I'm going to talk about some things about my life that I've not spoken about in public before. I actually just had some questions about you folks out here before I started. Um, I know some people are in this group. How many people here, by a showing of your hands, have had family members murdered um, by juveniles? Okay, I'm seeing six people, seven people. I'm sorry. And how many people here are from groups or associated with groups that are in favor of having parole for juveniles with life sentences? Okay, I don't see anybody responding to that. Of the people who've had family members murdered, have any of you ever been approached by these groups that want to change the sentencing structure and to allow parole for, the, for juveniles? Anybody? One, but you're, you're the head of, of an organization. Initiated. You initiated. Okay, my experience is this. I started my career in Alameda County, a system of very, very aggressive prosecution of crimes. The system, the prosecutors were trained by people like Ed Meese, Lowell Jensen, and they played fair and they were ethical, but they were tough. And when I hear the examples of these juveniles who've been essentially not guilty of any major crime and they're given life without the possibility of parole, and I see these pamphlets by Humans, Human Rights Watch and so on saying, we have to help these children, I'm going, yes, help them, help them, until I look at the facts and I go, wait a minute, these facts can't be right. The, I know some of the prosecutors involved, they would never do that. I know the law, and a kid who never used a gun was given a 10-year enhancement, which only comes when you've used the gun, so the facts are wrong. And I recognize that the people who've done the serious studies of this issue understand what I understand, that there are certain people who've done crimes that are so heinous that if they're let out, they will do it again. And I understand that if there are people who are given life without parole who don't deserve it, convicted when they're not really guilty, obviously we have to get them out or help them. But somehow the attack on the juvenile life without parole system is an attack on all of us who've been crime victims, and it's an attack on people who want to be safe. Now, I've been a defense attorney my whole life, and when I came home 
on October 15, 2005, I had been representing a woman who was abused from her late teen years by her therapist. She married him and 25 years later killed him. And my defense was that the abuse she suffered helped justify what she did. Maybe not as a full excuse, but it was not the same as cold-blooded murder. But when I came home, what I found was my wife lying on the floor, beaten, blood everywhere, sprayed on the walls, the furniture moved. What I didn't see was the fact that as she lay there dying but alive, the perpetrator had taken a knife and opened up her belly to remove her organs when she was alive and that when she died, he carved into her back his sign, his symbol, a satanic symbol that he used on his artwork. And I can tell you that I, when he finally was caught, like probably every single person here who suffered the same thing, wanted to kill him. I wanted him dead. But society doesn't do what I want. Society is civilized, and society placed him on trial, gave him a great attorney, a fantastic defense, and he was convicted, and vengeance was never extracted. He was put away for the rest of his life without parole so that he will not hurt anyone again. In time, his security classification will drop. He will be able to marry, have conjugal visits, and communicate with family members and his groupies um, who think he's a cute man, good looking, just like the Night Stalker, Richard Ramirez, has lots of groupies. He has a life, but he will not be able to take a life unless it's of another prisoner who's go and he's going to have a hard time because they're awful tough where he is. So vengeance doesn't belong to the victims even though we may want it. But justice belongs to society because what he did was so horrific that if he ever gets out, he'll do it again. You know, he studied being a serial killer. He read books about it. He planned it. He beat her with a rock slowly so he could watch her die. In, at the trial, I watched every bit of, of the trial, the pretrial hearings. He never showed any remorse, but he showed great fascination when the pictures of Pamela slaughtered were put up on the screen. He was fascinated. I thought I was the only one seeing it, but the judge commented on that at sentencing. But who are these people who want to allow somebody like him to get released on parole, or at least the possibility of release? Well, Senator Yee of California is one of them. He put forth a bill that would totally revamp California sentencing. It would allow somebody like Scott Dulesky to get a parole hearing if he could prove to a judge that he was remorseful. What does remorseful mean? Well, remorseful is the word that Senator Yee used in his bill. But the definition of remorseful, he took a course when available in prison to further himself educationally. Kept contacts with other people when he was in prison, but yeah. Scott keeps contacts with the people who have websites saying that he's innocent, despite the statements that he made about seeing Pamela on the road and she reaching out and grabbing his arm, which is how he may have gotten his DNA on her body. And she said, this can't be happening. That's his story, driving on the road. She just stopped and did that. Well, I'll tell you, he told the truth about one thing. As he was slaughtering her, I'm sure Pamela said, this can't be happening perhaps as he came in masked and gloved into our house. When they found his DNA on her body as she fought back and his bloody footprint in the house, this is what convicted him. This is what convicted him, and yet there's websites that raise money, thousands of dollars for him, to help set him free. And at his parole hearing, those people will be there funding him, advocating for him. His mother who came onto the property where she, where she lived, where he had hidden in an abandoned truck, the bloody gloves, the bloody 
evidence of the crime. She went into that truck and started to remove them to destroy them until a press helicopter came overhead and she got scared. She then went to Point Reyes, a few hours away from our home, and burned his diary, burned the items that implicated him. His girlfriend's mother, who I now see in my town of Lafayette, who smiles at me, hi. She took evidence from her daughter of the murder, took it up to Point Reyes to be destroyed. At the trial, Dolesky's mother, after first having called me on the phone um, when we didn't know her son was the killer, and said, can I help? Can I make you a casserole? At the trial, bashed me with her purse. She will be at the parole hearing, saying her son is innocent. The mother of the girlfriend will say he's a nice young man. The two school teachers who could have stopped the crime, one was his art teacher. He drew art showing the murderous acts that he was going to do towards Pamela. He drew them in the abstract. She admitted on the witness stand that the rules in the school, were, when you see something disturbing like that, you go to the principal, you let the kid get help. She didn't do it because she thought he was artistic. She doesn't believe he committed the crime. She'll be at the parole hearing. The teacher who thought he was cute, the ultimate Frisbee teacher, she had a crush on him, like a schoolgirl crush. She thought he was a loner because he was sensitive, did nothing to help him. She'll be at the parole hearing. She testified he didn't do it. You know who won't be at that parole hearing? I won't, because I'm 54 years old. Because having gone through that time period with Pamela, my health is not the same as it was. I will not be there at that parole hearing. But these people will, and he will. And if he gets paroled, just remember that he'll be laughing. He'll be laughing at this crime that he enjoyed. He'll be laughing that as a serial killer, he fooled people and got out. I've represented defendants for many years, and you might think that because I'm realistic, maybe I'm not such a good defense attorney. Well, I haven't lost a case in three, four years. I've lost one case in three, four years because I'm real with my clients. I'm realistic with them. And I know that when they are damaged in certain ways, they don't get better. They can control to some degree what they do, but they don't get better. Why is it so easy for us to accept child molesters don't get better? We accept that, and it's true, they don't. They control their behavior, but with a little alcohol or an opportunity, they don't get better. Would you, any of you, let a convicted child molester babysit your children, no matter what kind of therapy they went through? No, you wouldn't. Would you let a rapist be with your loved ones? No, they don't get better. It is the same with cold-blooded murderers. I'm not talking about situational murderers or, or um, you know, people who are acting maybe under tremendous duress, but murderers who choose to kill because it's what they want to do. It suits their purpose. Don't get better. It is a way of being. And what I say to Senator Yee, what I say on my website about this, what I say right now is that if you would release a person who has committed the kind of murders that we've heard about here, would you invite them to your home for dinner? That's actually what my friend Judge Karish, Judge Joe Karish, who you know, um, used to tell me when I'd say, Judge, my client is innocent. If my client couldn't have done this crime. He'd say, Dan, you're a vigorous advocate, but would you invite him to your house today for dinner? And these people who want to release all juveniles on parole after a certain time, they believe that people change over time and the brain develops and they get better, that's not how it works. I know that from being there. What happens with juveniles who commit these heinous crimes is that they're so broken that they manifest it at a very young age. They start fires, they hurt animals, they hurt people at an age when other kids are playing ball, are in school, do, doing school activities. If they're that damaged young, Nothing miraculously happens to them in the 10, 20, 30 years that they're incarcerated, except maybe they can learn how to act more normally. What I've learned is that with sheriff's deputies or prison guards giving them a very structured routine, a lot of people who would be heinous criminals on the outside can function somewhat normally. But when you take those controls off of them and put them in life, 
and life is hard and life kicks you and life hurts you and life puts you down when things go wrong these people do not have the tools they lose their control and they revert to who they are to what they did and that is not with every single juvenile offender it is not with every single murderer but when you talk about people like Scott Dulesky, it is true. And when you talk about a lot of the people given life without parole, it is true. And let me tell you something. When I read these Human Rights Watch and all these other stories about these kids who are wrongly accused or wrongly convicted or way over convicted, if it wasn't real, I'd laugh. There's one that I read that comes from Oakland, so I know the people involved. The story goes, this young man, and they don't give his last name, so we can't find the case. This young man heard that his friend was going to commit a robbery. To stop any violence from taking place, he went along. His friend pulled the gun and shot the store owner. He was then convicted and given life without parole, plus 10 years for use of the gun. Well, I know the head of the juvenile division, um, the, there's, there's two of them I know, one of his, one's a good friend of mine. He doesn't know about the case. He would never have done that. And the other, I had a case with him years ago, a drive-by. My client was in the car, a good kid, except he went along with the drive-by to be tough. One kid was shot and killed, and a young woman, an innocent woman, was shot in the face. The deal was my client testifies, and he would be convicted, but if he had testified and apologized, he would get two years in Vision Quest, sort of a boot camp. Now this is the same lead um, head of the office who supposedly let a kid who just went to a crime scene to stop the crime get life without parole? No way. And then I know what judge it's supposed to be because uh, there's something in the sentencing, a way the judge does things that's very peculiar to him. And I asked the judge, do you know anything about this case? He said, I never heard about this case. You know, where a kid was not involved in and, and I, I, would, I would never give a kid like that that kind of sentence. And then when I looked again, it's 10 years for the gun. <coughs> Excuse me. In California, 10 years is personal use of the gun. The real story, if you could find the file, would be that this kid did the shooting. So they lied about it. They lied about it. And every single story that I read in this Human Rights Watch monograph that the California State Senate relied on to vote in favor of this bill seemed ridiculous legally. You know, you've got, first of all, prosecutors who are not animals. These guys are prosecutors. They're regular people. They're not beasts. And you'd have to be a beast to try to put a kid who didn't pull a gun and wanted to stop a crime in prison for the rest of his life. Secondly, you have to have a defense attorney who's totally incompetent. Then you'd have to have a jury of 12 people who would vote guilty on something like that. Would, would any, any of you? No. Then you have to have a judge. In California, the judge can say, it's life without parole or life with parole. You'd have to have a judge who's also a beast to do that kind of sentencing. Then you'd have to have an appellate lawyer who doesn't raise the gross inequity of, of, of the issue and a court of appeals that ignores it. You would have to have so many people being incompetent and cruel. It's just ridiculous. So what is this debate about? Why are they using these fake pictures, these fake stories to advance a cause? Truthfully, I don't have a clue. But I know that what they're doing is wrong. I know that we have to stand up against these people. And the bottom line is this. We are all, even people who I don't agree with politically on this issue, we are all against injustice. No system works when somebody is unjustly imprisoned or given a ridiculously harsh sentence. I have never met anybody, who, a rational person in, in this debate, who wants to harshly imprison juveniles to be mean. We want to imprison people who are going to come out and hurt again. And believe me, people on parole commit crimes again and again, more than half of them do. When you release these kinds of criminals on parole, when they're adults, they're smarter, they know how to hide their crimes better, all that's going to happen is that there will be more people like these people in the audience whose hearts are broken, whose families are broken, who are saying, why did you let him out Leave him in jail. We don't get revenge, but nobody else gets hurt. That's why they're here, and that's why I'm here. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is the time when you have the opportunity to ask questions. And so if you'll raise your hands, and I'll try to see through this light right over here.
Hi, how are you? Would you identify yourself yes, and then sir. ask your question? Yeah. <clears throat> My name is uh, Ronald Holt. I am a uh, Chicago police officer, and I'm here with uh, co-founder Jennifer Bishop and um, Daryl and Don Romick, Jody Robinson, and we are representing the National Organization of Victims of uh, Juvenile Lifers. Um, being an 18-year police officer in Chicago, I've uh, worked with gangs at risk youth um, who have killed uh, and belong to uh, street gangs. Uh, they've committed a lot of gun crimes and uh, other felonies. Moreover, my only son, Blair Holt, who was uh, 16 years old, this is a picture of him. This was his last high school picture. He was 16 years old on May 10th, three weeks shy of his uh, 17th uh, birthday. He was gunned down on a bus uh, protecting a young lady heroically. Four other young people were shot as well. Uh, unfortunately, Blair didn't survive his wounds. Uh, the offender who murdered Blair was 16 and was sentenced to 100 years uh, in Illinois, in an Illinois prison on July 20th, 2009. Uh, in Illinois, because of the truth in sentencing, uh, this, this is an effective uh, sentencing and this is an effective life sentencing. Uh, but for the majority of my career, I've worked the streets and witnessed constant violence regularly. So my question, my question is, how can victims advocates be so divorced from reality from what I see on the streets of Chicago regularly. Thank you for taking my question. Okay, we'll ask the panel, how can the people who are advocating these changes be so divorced from reality? Who wants to start? Maybe I can say this. You know, in my experience, a lot of people on the defense side, which is the side I take, have trouble dealing with the, the victims and their feelings. Now, when Pamela was killed, the people I knew in the defense bar, not as good friends, but just as business friends, shunned me. They couldn't go near me. Whereas prosecutors who I'd fought with and might, might have even had some acrimony with reached out to me. And I think there may be a sort of a, um, a mindset on the part of that group of people where they dehumanize the victims and dehumanize the families in order to do their jobs. And I, I think you're feeling the, the effects of that, which is unfortunate. It, it's interesting, Officer Holt, that because Dan and I never met before this morning. You know, obviously, we would be natural enemies, probably <laughs> being you know, uh, 20 years as a prosecutor and, and almost 30 years as a defense attorney. But we, we spoke a little bit about his experience and the fact that the prosecutors did reach out to him. And I do think that that's got a big, a big part of it. And, and that is that they've almost convinced themselves by the way they write about the crimes, about these pictures, that in fact it's not an important public safety issue, but it's also not an important victim's issue. Um, there are two reasons for these sentences. One is to ensure the safety of the public. From my perspective, and I have sat through parole hearings with families and pardons hearings and all of the like, the re-victimization that happens again and again as it's brought up. Um, is very, very difficult. And therefore, one of the reasons, for instance, someone like me would advocate against uh, or for a life without parole is not having those times where there is some right to re-victimize, to bring this up again, and to have the families live through it. I've, I've seen it plenty of times. Um, I truly believe that they, uh, I don't, mean anything ill of, of people on the other side of this debate, but I don't know that they've informed themselves well enough as to the whole dynamic of what has happened here. Somebody has made an adult decision to commit an adult crime, and it has left very, very adult consequences. And that person lives with it in the prison. You live with that every day of your life, and, and we see that. It's the reason not to have uh, parole hearings and some expectation that you are going to have to go through that again. Cully? I think that um, I would have a tremendous amount of respect, Officer Holt, if 
the argument from the other side was um, we don't want to see life without parole sentences for juvenile killers because as a compassionate society, we think other sentences are appropriate and leave it at that. Um, at least that would be honest. It would send a warning order to all the victims that are here and the millions of others in the United States, look, it, this is an issue of compassion. We're a compassionate country uh, and we don't like it. Now, I would respectfully disagree. Um, but instead, this uh, campaign has been less than forthright, honest, and direct. And um, it ignores, and I think Paul put it well, um, the re-victimization that will take place over and over and over in courtrooms and parole board hearings around the country, oftentimes without the victims there or their family representative there because many states don't require the prosecutor to give notice to the victims, nor do they have time to give the officer Holtz notice to show up. And so, um, you know, oddly enough, uh, I think one of the primary responsibilities of most prosecutors is to be a human rights attorney, to think out, think for the rights of everybody, especially the victims. You all know that when you try a pro per case, and General Meese and I have talked about this, a person who's representing himself before the court, you're actually trying two cases at once. You're protecting the rights of the accused, who doesn't understand the system, and you're representing the people, the state, as ably as you can. Um, and so I don't have the foggiest clue either, but I would at least appreciate a more honest approach. Other questions from the audience? I see a, a hand. Yes, over here. Samar Chatterjee from Safe Foundation. Um, I would like to present a little different perspective. Firstly, this is not a debate. Uh, it seems you've got at least three speakers out of four, and I haven't heard Mr. Meese see your speech, so I'm sorry about that. But uh, uh, it seems like it is one-sided. Um, I would like to not argue the legal aspect, since I'm not a lawyer. But I do think in your statistics, Mr. Stimson, you said in U.S. Uh, leads the world in crime. And, and since I'm, I've come from outside this country and uh, s lived in this country since 1970, I have found that, uh, firstly, the legal system, the police, policing as well as prosecution, is pretty brutal in this country. Uh, and in my opinion, that is one which creates more criminals in this country. So that may be one aspect we should give some thought to. The second is somehow the upbringing of people are pretty brutal. I've had even friends sometimes tell me, come on, we want to talk to you, have a meeting, and if things don't work out, I'll shoot you. And uh, I, I never went to with a gun to defend myself, <laughs> but uh, thanks God it was a joke, not uh, real. But there are people in this country, not all again, uh, it should be a small minority, I'm hoping, uh, who are pretty brutal. And you know, when I saw, when we had those torture pictures come up, one congressman or a senator said in a meeting, I didn't believe these, these are Americans doing it. There are Americans who are that brutal. and. Some of you who have gone through those sufferings, you know that there are people like that, and particularly this gentleman, Dan, who described the process, which was pretty brutal. And I don't know how there are people like that, unfortunately. I hope we change our way of upbringing younger people also. Those are the two suggestions. Comments? I just want to say I, I, I agree with you, but to the extent that you're saying, <coughs> excuse me, if we could just prevent you know, what, what's going on, if we can create a more compassionate society, we would be better off. And I wish a lot of this attention that's being directed towards letting violent killers out on parole, if that money would be taken and put it into programs when they're young to stop them from committing these crimes, we'd all be better off. And, and I think I could speak for all of us up here, including General Meese, that it would, in a perfect world, uh, police would never engage uh, in behavior uh, that we all couldn't be proud of and that we should have a per perfect criminal justice system. And that's why I open my comments by saying that 
the real test of a just and civilized society is how well we treat the defendants and the victims uh, in our criminal justice system. Um, but one of the, the reasons, uh, sir, that I pointed out uh, the comparative analysis between crimes committed by people in the United States and other countries is to rebut the myth that we're all the same or that um, we're the only country, uh, we're like all other countries uh, in terms of our crimes. And so I went to uh, the left's favorite repository of people, the UN, and looked at their statistics and the World Health Organization statistics in one given year. Although if you take any look at over a 10 year period, you'll see that the US, including juveniles in the US, commit crimes uh, that dwarf those in other countries that are reported. Now I would agree with you completely that there are a lot of crimes that go unreported, especially in uh, many countries around the world, but we just can't put our hands around that in terms of an analysis. Paul, do you have any comments? Yeah. Okay. Uh, let, let me just uh, mention, by the way, that this is not billed as a debate. Uh, this is billed really as the presentation of a refutation of a great deal of information that is out of, in the public uh, world, uh, which has been put out by groups on the other side. But this is to herald the presentation of the study which has gone on for the last year and a half. Now we'll take questions up here in the front row. Hi, I'm Penny Starr with CNS News. I wanted to ask um, if the uh, organizations that are fighting against this uh, for juveniles being sentenced to life without parole, are they listed in your publication or who, who are these folks? And how will, these, how will this affect uh, the Supreme Court when it comes back in session? Well, Ms. Starr, if I could tell you how the Supreme Court was going to rule, I'd be a rich man. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Yes, there's the uh, two cases coming out of Florida. Uh, Graham and Sullivan are the two uh, defendants' names. Um, they are procedurally in a different posture, and so they'll probably be argued back to back the same day, but they will probably not be joined for purposes of the argument. Um, yes, we list uh, all of the organizations uh, in our report uh, and in our footnotes. Um, and look, um, uh, this report. Uh, will go out uh, to all prosecutors in the country, uh, many key state legislators, uh, many judges and justices around the country, um, key uh, victims' rights groups, uh, state think tanks. It will be widely dispersed. And of course, it's available right now as we speak on the Heritage website, www.heritage.org, and you'll see it prominently displayed there. And you can download either the whole paper or each chapter. Uh, and I, it's our hope that we have an open and honest and direct debate going forward. Uh, and I do believe uh, that Paul is correct that um, the court will not be tempted to breach the wall between death penalty uh, jurisprudence and non-death penalty. Uh, at least that's my hope. One, one way I can tell you that the, the report is helpful, and for instance, some, for someone like myself, when I had to try to gather the statistics, um, I really had to depend on many of the reports coming from the other side because there was no good repository of that information. So this is helpful in that it gives the, the counter statement of what the real facts are and, um, and in a very realistic way. Um, I know I was involved in one of the particular cases and I know what the spin was before in some of those other reports. So it can be helpful. I guarantee you it will be cited. Uh, probably to various courts around the country um, because that's what we need to do to get the information out. Question over here. Hi, I'm Deborah Weiss. I'm a former juvenile prosecutor. And I just want to say I think um, it is really a slippery slope because I've never done a death penalty kinds of cases or murder cases, but even for the more minor offenses, just simple assaults or battery or anything like that, I can't tell you how many times the other side legal aid the entire defense consisted of their juvenile. They're, they're young, and I was like, yeah, so what? As though they can't form intent, or even if they do form intent, it doesn't count because they're below a certain age. I never understood it, but I just wanted to say I do think it's a slippery slope. And the other thing I wanted to comment on the, in response to something someone said here about our country maybe has more crime because our criminal system and our police officers are so violent. Um, 
I don't know what country the person comes from who said that, but I would argue, if anything, it's the opposite. It's because we have freedom that we have so much crime. If you go to the countries that have a lot less crime, it's because they're afraid of doing anything or they're going to wind up with the, you know, with the police uh, throwing them in jail. And, um, and my final comment, uh, just about what you said with the compassion, um, you know, that you wish they would just say, oh, we, we were a comp compassionate society, I wish we, they wouldn't do that, is there's an ancient saying that says that being kind to the cruel is like being cruel to the kind. I'm sorry I made comments instead of a question. I don't usually do that. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any other questions that uh, anyone has? Yes, over here. Robert Ault from Heritage. I just wanted to see, and I, I don't know if folks on the panel are familiar with the studies on this, but I know one of the major arguments that was made in Roper, and I presume is being extended to the current debate, goes to questions, uh, go, jumping off your question, as to whether or not juveniles are capable of forming intent. Is there a difference in cerebral development? And particularly since Coley began by talking about the fact that there's been grave distortions in the ages of the offenders by some of the others, uh, if you'd be able to talk about whether there actually is any credibility to those sorts of arguments about cerebral development. Well, one of the things um, that we chose not to delve into just because it was outside of our lane, and um, I'm certainly not a psychiatrist or a psychologist, and I wanted to keep the paper to about 100 pages, is this, this notion that, um, uh, like you were pointing out in Roper, that uh, juveniles' brains are so underdeveloped uh, that they really can't be held accountable for their actions. Uh, I will say that in the Roper case, there were two amici filed on behalf uh, of the government. There were 15 on behalf of the accused. Uh, that will be quite different uh, this time around. Uh, you're going to see uh, all prosecutors in the country joining together. Uh, state legislators, uh, international law scholars, and a lot of other people, and including people uh, who work in uh, psychology and psychiatry, uh, <laughs> saying that uh, this issue of whether brains are sufficiently developed uh, is sort of a head, it sort of uh, um, doesn't hold a lot of water. Uh, there's a, a, a renowned um, PhD psychologist, JD, who's a professor at UPenn who authored a law review article at the Ohio State Law Journal uh, a couple years ago criticizing the Roper decision. And the first line, I think, says it all. He says, uh, people commit crimes, brains don't. And so um, are, are there people, individuals out there who are uh, mentally incompetent or don't have sufficient ability to understand uh, the nature of the proceedings before them or assist in their own defense? Absolutely, and they should not be tried in court at all. They should be held mentally incompetent and incapable of uh, subjecting them to, uh, to the criminal process. But we're not talking about those people. We're talking about people who uh, think through their crimes, like Roper, uh, plan them out, uh, and go forward. It, it also strikes me as a little odd, and I think it, if you think about it just generally, folks, how can we hear on the one side of the ledger, completely outside of the criminal law context, that young people, 12, 13, 14, can make life's most important choices. Uh, uh, birth, death, avoiding a fetus, et cetera, and they're perfectly capable of doing that. Yet, over here in the criminal law context, uh, their brains aren't sufficiently developed to be held accountable for murdering somebody. It's, there's a disconnect, and I think regional, reasonable people, rational people realize that there, will come, there comes a point in time in the, the development of a teen where they're certainly capable uh, of being held accountable for the things that they planned and did. Well, I'm afraid we've come to the end of our time here. I appreciate very much uh, the questions from the audience and also the good work by our panel. Please join me in thanking our panel for their presentations today. And with that, we conclude uh, this presentation by the Heritage Foundation. Thank you for being with us.